Hi, my name is Maya Manso. I am with She Creates Peace, and I help people navigate grief to find their passion and purpose so that they can turn that into prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show, where we dive deep into the stories, strategies, and successes of remarkable individuals shaping our digital landscape. I'm your host, Prosper Tarubinga, and today we have a remarkable guest who is no stranger to turning life's lemons into lemonade. Now, Maya, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, thank you. Absolutely. Now, Maya, you know, when I heard about your story and what you went on and did about it, I just thought, wow, this is somebody we need to bring on to the show because so many people are going through, um, you know, grief in their day to day. I mean, things have happened in the last couple of years that have just left a lot of people shaken. And um, yet you are there to give people a glimmer of hope after having gone through your own um, story. So for those that are watching right now, you're just wondering what is Prosper going on about? Well, in a world where chaos seems to reign supreme, our guest has actually found a way to navigate the turbulent waters of loss, grief, and found purpose with grace, um, coupled with resilience. And yes, even with a touch of humor, even though there's... Um, there's always a silver lining to every dark cloud. And um, I, I just thought I'd bring her in because I think she's the lady that creates peace above all. Uh, oh, she's just going to tell us a little bit about um, her story and uh, what actually happened to her, where she is now helping other individuals transform their pain into purpose and their grief into growth. Now, my I could go on and on, and then it defies the whole purpose of having you on the show today. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how um, you got started on your path. Well, the, the, my journey is filled with grief, but also hope. Um, in late 2003, I was really at a point in my life, it was one of those transition points where you have to decide what's important to you. I had lost my dad the prior December. My mother-in-law was terminally ill. I was in a very rough um, place at work. Um, I had great job stability, but I was working um, 80 to 100 hours a week and on a plane a lot. And I had two young teenage daughters and I just thought there has to be more to life than this. And in early 2004, I took a leap of faith that I really struggled with making the decision, but I decided to jump into being an entrepreneur and start a wedding photography business. Now, I did this because it was my passion and I wanted to be able to spend a lot of time with my daughters. What I didn't know when I started that was that it was it became both of my daughter's passions as well. So as they grew up into teenagers and young adults, they actually joined me in my business, which was absolutely amazing to have not only a great mother-daughter relationship with them, but then to have the business experience on top of that. But the real gift of taking that leap was that I had really a profound relationship with my daughters. And when I look back, my daughter passed, my older daughter passed away in 2013 from a very brief illness. She had leukemia. And I look back at my decision to take that leap of faith and I cannot express how grateful that I am that I, that I 
changed the way I was living and changed the way I was working because I was able to be in the, I, I had experience with her for the last nine years of her life in this profound way that I would never have had had I stayed in my nine to five job. Wow. That is, that is something. And um, I mean, sorry to hear about your daughter and, um, you know, that which happened. Tell us what sort of jobs were you doing that demanded much of your time like this? So I was working for a software company and I was a project manager, a system architect. I had uh, a lot of technical writers and quality assurance people working for me. And we had gone through uh, an attempted buyout of the software company that failed. And when it failed, the uh, management decided that they would lay off about half of the employees. And so the rest of us that were kept had to pick up the slack. And being a product manager, I also was on a plane quite often uh, to go kind of soothe the customers that were very upset that they were not getting things in a timely fashion. So it was extremely, extremely stressful. Mm, I can imagine. And obviously, while we're doing that, because fish do not see the water that they're swimming in, and neither do some people notice that what they're going through is, you know, essentially not helping them in the end. Um, you know, when you then started the wedding business, did you completely cut ties with this business or did you continue doing that? But, you know, obviously weddings sometimes happen during the weekends. Well, I my original intention was to start it as a side business and see how it happened. And in March, at the end of March, I was driving to work. It was my birthday. And I was just thinking about the fact that I think my daughters were were uh, 12 and 14 that year. And I so desperately wanted to spend time with them that summer. And I thought, if I don't do it this summer, they're going to be too old and I'm not, it's not going to be cool to hang with mom. And I thought, you know what? I am going to give myself the best birthday present ever. And I went in and I quit. Now, uh, the the good news is that they were very upset that I quit. And they said, you know what? Take the summer completely off. In the fall, we would like to hire you as a consultant. You can work as much or as little as you want, but your knowledge is so important to us. And so I've actually... Um, maintained a consulting relationship. Um, I worked consulting for them for a couple of years part-time and um, I still do some consulting in that arena, but um, I walked away from that job. I My intention that morning when I went in was I need to rest. I need to recover my health because I've been making myself sick. And it was such a tremendous leap of faith, but it was the best thing that I ever did. Absolutely. Absolutely. And good on you for choosing yourself because, you know, amongst all of this, people, somebody would have just stayed in there just hoping that things are going to turn around and, you know, things of that nature. Now, when you started this show, you also mentioned you'd lost your dad and mom was also going through stuff. Now, in between you traveling and everything else, how did you cope with that family requirement, especially because half of the time, you know, we, we need to be there for our loved ones? Um, it, it was very hard. My dad had a long end-of-life illness and was... Uh, I lived in Maine. They were in Florida for a good part of his illness. So there was some flying back and forth and working remotely. But, you know, really, when it comes down to it, you have to decide what's important in life. 
and you have to decide, it is important for me. I decided that it was important for me to really work, to do what I needed to do at work. But ultimately, that's why I decided to quit because the time with the family was so important. And, you know, after my daughter died, well, actually, I'll start with, uh, she was diagnosed with leukemia. She was 23. She had just gotten married. And I was the one that took her to the emergency room the day she was diagnosed. And I called up the person that I did the consulting through. And I said, my daughter's just been diagnosed with leukemia. I don't know when we will talk next. And he said, absolutely. The only reason why you need to call me is to tell me what you need that I can do for you. And she was only sick for about three months. And after she died, I literally sat in a chair and cried all day, every day for about two months. And as I started to come back to life a little bit, I reached out to him and I said, I, I need to go back to work. And he said, do you need the money yet? And I said, no. He's like, you don't need to work yet. I was like, oh, you know, just I was so grateful. And I ended up taking almost a year off from the consulting. I ended up closing the wedding photography business. My daughter had become my business partner. And the thought of photographing someone else's wedding right after she had gotten married and then died. I just couldn't do it. And every day, like a mantra going through my head, I just kept thinking, why am I still here when she is not? What is my purpose? Like, if I'm going to be here and I'm going to wake up every morning, there has to be a reason. And short term, my purpose became trying to figure out how to create peace. You know, in the beginning, I was sure I would never be okay. And a friend of mine sat down, sat me down one day and she said, you know, if you continue to believe that you will never be okay, she said, that will become your truth. So next time you think, I will never be okay, she said, I want you to stop yourself and I want you to say, I will be okay someday, just not today. Oh. And that was really transformational for me that allowed me to open a door to the possibility of healing, even when at that point in the beginning, I remotely couldn't believe that that was possible. And so the first thing I started to work on was just being content. You know, instead of being just incredibly distraught all of the time, I'm like, what would bring me contentment? How, how can I be okay with where I am today? And slowly I started to figure some things out. And then they weren't all horrible days and there were some okay days. And then there were even some good days. And on the good days, I started to try and find some joy in life again. Mm. And as contentment and joy started to creep in, I started to think about what are the meaningful connections in life? Who, who is in my life that is so important that I want to nurture those connections? And so ultimately... I came to define peace as an inner state of being that you reach when you can find contentment, joy, and connection, kind of regardless of the circumstances. Because I couldn't change the fact that my daughter had died and that I would always grieve her. But I, I could start to find some purpose and some contentment and some joy and some meaningful connection. And so that became my my focus for probably the first three or four years after she died. And then 
I believe that the best way to really move beyond that very, uh, I'm going to say self-centered, but self-care, you know, environment is to start to help others that are going through what you're going through. Because as I started to find my purpose and my passion and, and move forward, other people looked at me and said, Hey, how did you do that? Like what, I'm going to say, what tricks did you use or what techniques did you use to kind of shift you from this? I am never going to be okay again to this. You know what? I have peace in my life. I have, I have joy. It's okay to feel joy. And, and so the being of service in a very purposeful way just happened naturally. That's, that's remarkable because what you're saying is if you shift the wall is me and you project it onto other people to see how can I be of help to those that might be going through what I'm going through, that in and of itself obviously now gives you a reason for being because you had to go through what you went through so that you had, well, not only a good story to tell on the online prosperity show, but a reason for you to then showcase to other people that they too can go beyond that, which, and you speak about that in some of your you know, speaking where you help people find purpose after loss. Now, you did. You found it by helping others navigate their grief and actually start reclaiming their passion. What sort of invisible lessons or insights? Because you were almost talking about the traits earlier on, but mm -hmm. you didn't go in there that you've actually gathered in your own journey that you believe maybe a lot of people need to know, especially when they, because you know, yep. no, nobody would wish that upon their own worst enemy even. Agreed. Agreed. Well, you know, the, the first thing that I think really allows you to make a shift, I call it declaring dominion. But basically, it's giving yourself permission at a soul level to move ahead. You know, when my daughter died, it was so hard to imagine me going out and rebuilding a life without her in it. We have we we worked together, we enjoyed each other's company, we vacationed together. And so I expected her to be in my life every day. And she had just gotten married and had wanted to start a family. And so we had plans to uh, have her babies in the office and I'd be a very hands-on grandmother. And so when I lost her, I lost all of that. And it was hard to imagine um, giving myself permission to move on without her, to find happiness without her, because I think I think that biologically we're programmed that our kids have to, our kids' survival is of the utmost importance. So if you failed at that because your child died, even though it was not any of my own doing, but it's so hard to move forward. And I talk with parents all the time who have lost children and it could have happened 20 years ago and they are still kind of locked in that moment of when that child died. And I, I understand that. But I will also say my daughter would have been the first one to kick my behind and tell me to get up off the chair and go make a life because she would never have wanted me to have stayed buried in that. Well, I can imagine because I really believe that each and every one of us are on somewhat of a journey in life. And sometimes some people are there to just really give us the lessons that we need in life. And if we would, you know, um, you know, honor them in what they have taught us, 
that in and of itself would create, um, you know, lasting peace. And, and I think this is what you have gone on and done, you know, taking all of that instead of, um, you know, just woe is me, which a lot of people would end up being in there. Now, do you believe maybe the, what they call the five stages of grief are, you know, what people really need to have an understanding so that they can see what stage they're in? Because I think the first one is denial. You know, in your case, you wouldn't have wanted that. Hey, like you said, you didn't want that your daughter uh, passes on before you do or you start feeling like you are an in inadequate um, you know, parent, and then there's then the anger of why her, you know, and I think there's times when you would have been like, that could have just been <laughs> me, and then you start bargaining now to say, okay, yeah. right, I, I really need to get up, and I think part of the bargaining that you did was when you knew you had to go to work, but your work decided, no, this is not the time that, you know, you know, take your time, and then when you're ready, come back and then did you go through any maybe depression because I know you've accepted but was there any oh I I've definitely been through all of the stages and I would say I was in extreme depression for probably three or four years um I grieving is is not an orderly thing grieving is the best way I would describe navigating grieving is learning what triggers you. Um, holidays are terribly hard after you've lost someone. Um, her birthday, incredibly hard. Um, things that you don't expect to trigger you. For example, um, about a year after she passed away, I was on Facebook one day and I saw my one of my nieces had put out an announcement that she was pregnant. Mm. And I was so happy for her, but I was more devastated that I would never have that with my daughter. And I think that's probably one of the big lessons about grief that I want to would want to talk about is that things that you're like, well, that should have made me really happy. And instead that made me feel really sad, or I felt both happy and sad at the same time. Like that, I don't think people understand how, you know, like on, on my, my younger daughter, she got married five years ago and her sister obviously wasn't there. And so that day was both extremely happy and extremely sad. It, it's not like I had one emotion and then the other. It's like you have them, you have all the emotions at the same time. And there have been points where I've been profoundly depressed. There have been points where I have been um, probably fewer where I've been just really angry. But yeah, you you have them all. They all happen at some point. Mm. And but your journey, um, your healing journey sort of took obviously several years of therapy, spirituality, and eventually finding your true path and your true self in the process. Just walk us through what that was like for you and how you actually then found your voice amidst all of this. I will I will tell you that I, I am someone who always tries to help everyone else. And so the first thing that I knew was that I could not do group grief counseling because I would want to help everybody else and I wouldn't be able to focus on myself. <laughs> I will tell you that the most profound experience I had in regaining my voice was I did an overnight sit in the woods by myself on a September evening. And I was with a group of people 
that if I had had an issue, I could have gotten to them. But we were spread out in the woods. I was sitting by a brook. I could not see anyone, could not hear anyone. And we started at about, I don't know, eight o'clock at night and sat in the woods by ourselves with our own thoughts and minimal things with us um, until about four o'clock in the morning. And I am a very spiritual person and I feel very connected to, I'm going to call it my higher self, but that part of me that knows that sees more than I do, that's more knowing than I am. And all night long, I did this exercise that I now teach people. And it's called, Since You Didn't Ask. And it's a writing prompt. So you take a journal and you sit down and you say, Dear Mom, since you didn't ask, here's everything I need to say. Dear Dad, since you didn't ask, Here's everything. And dear Lindsay, which is my daughter that died. And so all night, I didn't have a journal with me, but all night long, I just was like kind of doing a life review. And what was it that I had not felt comfortable saying? And sometimes it was, I love you. I miss you. Other times it's like, you know what? I am really angry that this is how you treated me. So it, and it wasn't about them. It wasn't about whoever I was writing about. So in the morning after I got to a journal, I wrote, I don't know, eight or 10 pages, both sides in an eight and a half by 11 notebook of just dear whoever and just got it out. And then at the end, I burned the pages. Like these aren't letters that go to anybody else. It's about you finding your voice and getting it out there. Wow. Cause once you let it out, it's now in the open and it doesn't belong to you anymore. So you yeah. have no reason for it to burden you. Would that be yes. somewhat of a, a release, so to speak, because so many people have different words for it where you're sitting in and you're just recognizing um, energies or words or beliefs or things that no longer serve you and you're just letting them out and in the process that in and of itself is the cleansing which then obviously liberates you from everything that's just holding you to the past or the person you were that wow absolutely and I think, I think the beauty of this kind of an exercise is that no one's ever going to read this. Right. Right. Because no one's ever going to read it. You're going to burn it. You're going to destroy it. You give yourself permission to speak truths that you have not even acknowledged to yourself. Right. That's really confronting things that, uh, enjoying hiding inside and just knowing yes. at you without you realizing. And if you expose those either beliefs or truths or whether they are or not, they no longer have a place to hide. And, and once you have used your voice, you cannot unhear it. So now when you go about your life and you're making decisions about how to move forward, like, you know your truth now. So now you're knowingly making decisions from a, a much stronger position. Wow. But you've gone on and written something that you haven't burnt, though. You've written a book. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I, well, I've actually I've published four books now. Right. Two about grief and two about small business. Um. Because, you know, as I started talking about all of the ways that I've I've helped myself and helped others, um, it, it's writing books is such a powerful way to get the word out. It is allowing you to touch lives that you have no idea 
Like you will never meet this person in life. You'll never have that opportunity to have that conversation in person. But books are a wonderful way to share your knowledge. Absolutely. I absolutely believe we're here to leave, to learn and to contribute. So, you know, in life, we're learning all these lessons through our own experiences and uh, maybe uh, through other people's experiences. And once we've learned these lessons, we need to teach other people as well. So they too can be, do and have happier existence. And you've done all of those in spades. And now people are learning from you. Like you say, it's people that would never had any chance of knowing of you, but through your story and your journey and your experience, now they know how to deal, um, you know, with things like this when life happens. Now, just, you know, keeping to the theme of the Online Prosperity Show, let's talk about the book that you wrote, which is Navigating the Small Business Path. Um, mm -hmm. To start off, you went on and created a path for yourself that created you know time for you and your daughters um and i think it offers valuable insights for everybody who's getting started in business um maybe you could highlight a few key steps from this particular sure. book or from the journey you know that that have been very impactful uh, to the people that are reading them well, I'm going to give you my short formula for a business that is set up for long-term success. So to me, there are three parts of a business that all need to be in alignment in order to have long-term success. The first part is what I call the problem. That's the who and the what of your business. And the more you can the more you can think of your problem at your business as solving a specific problem, that people are willing to pay you to solve, the, the more you're going to have people interested in what you do. And you think you need to think about who you want to help. Because if you're not have if you don't like the people who have that problem, then that's probably not the problem that you need to solve. The second part is the passion, your passion, or the why of your business. That's why you're doing it, because you're passionate about it. And the why needs to align with the problem. The passion aligns with the problem. For example, if if you think about it, like opening a daycare, that's a that's a good business. There's always kids who need to be in a daycare. There's always parents looking for them. That's solving a real human need urgent human need, right? But if you don't like kids, if you're not passionate about helping kids, don't create a daycare because you're not going to be happy. They're not going to be happy. But if you are passionate and you love children and that's like ideal, then you're in alignment between the problem and the passion. Now, the third part of it is the plan of what I call the plan of action, right? And that's the how, the when, and the where of your business. But I'm going to focus on the how because the how is how you create a meaningful relationship with your customers. And again, you know, let's take the daycare example. How do you solve that? Well, you need to be open hours that parents need you to be open. You need to provide a learning environment, a play environment. You know, like there's there's a lot of things that you can help um, make your business more attractive you know if you're like i've got this one room and the kids sit in here all day parents are kind of be like yeah not so much but if you're like i have a playground and then i've got a library and i've got this and we have these toys and these services we teach these kids these things then parents are going to go you have a great plan of action and so if all of that lines up you're set up for long-term success because mm, so many people, like you say, you know, they just notice, oh, because when you're starting in business, they just say, find a problem, see if you can fix it. And that's an entrepreneurial way, you know what I mean? But if you're not passionate about diapers, don't open a daycare. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
Absolutely. I think I think I think if anything, a lot of people just really need to hear that statement. Right. If diapers are not your thing, then open a daycare. And um, so many people go into uh, certain aspects of business just because they've seen Sally, you know, being successful at it, but not knowing yeah. that the reason why they're doing that is maybe because they still want to keep the memory of their daughter alive. You know what I mean? And and you right. won't be able to go through the strengths that they are because you're not as passionate about the actual business as as you are. Now, obviously, building a business while you're navigating all this personal tragedy is not a small feat, Maya. Um, this is the part where we ask, how did she do it? How did she do it, right? But what sort of advice would you maybe give to aspiring entrepreneurs who are also facing their uphill battles? It might not be loss. It just might be funding. It might be no support from the people around them or really just juggling, navigating. Or maybe they actually don't have the passion to run that business, but they're you know, just really trying to throw pasta onto a wall and see what sticks. I think that, you know, when I, when I coach people who are looking, who either are trying to start a business or trying to figure out what business to start, I always go back to what are you passionate about? What is your purpose? And then how do you get prosperity from that? People often know what they're passionate about. They often are not sure at all what their purpose is. And I actually do like intuitive readings with people to help them figure out what their purpose is. And in almost every conversation I have with somebody, we look at what life experiences they have had that really clearly show them what their purpose is. So let me explain just a little bit more about that. We are all unique souls, if you will. And if I took DNA from my body and cloned it, and it became a living being, it would not be me because it wouldn't have my experiences. It wouldn't have my passions. You know, we we really come into this life, you know, every experience I've ever had, I am the only one who has ever had all of them. And even if I've had shared experience with others, I still have my perspective on that. And so, if you look at your life and you say, you know, I'll, I, oh, I know how to do this. And oh, I, I've had experience with that. Oh, that's a problem that I had to solve for myself. Oh, that's a problem I had to solve for other people. And you start adding up the sum of the experiences. Quite often, you'll be like, oh, I've gained so much wisdom about this problem and I know how to solve it. And I, I, I know I already have a base of wisdom. And even if there's three other people that have that a similar base of wisdom, we all still have our own unique perspective on it. And so always, always when I work with people, we will figure out what their purpose is so that they can move forward with that. Once you have your passion and your purpose, then we can go figure out what that problem is that you can solve and what that human need is, and we can fill in the rest of it. Wow. So you know what I was just thinking while you were talking about that, right? You told me you've been on a few podcasts, but this moment right here, it's the only moment that has existed that looks like this. And it's never going to happen ever again, even though we've recorded it. It's the yeah. only moment of its kind that's ever going to exist. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Now, 
obviously this is something that might take a lot of people <laughs> by you know by surprise but um you've also recently launched a new package where you say you're going to be helping individuals to get their businesses off the ground without maybe even expecting um any sort of payments until and after the work has been done first of all what inspired you to innovate such an approach and what sort of impact do you hope that this will do and have on your clients you know when i work with somebody who wants to start a business they need me the most when they have the least everybody I have people ask me all the time for free advice and I have no problem giving people free advice, but to actually work with somebody for, you know, my new program is I will work with somebody for 16 weeks. The first eight weeks, we will go through a preset course that teaches them all the principles. I'll meet with them one, um, one-on-one. -on -one. And then the next eight weeks, we launch their business and they start putting offerings out and they start seeing what do clients respond to? What do clients not respond to? My goal is to get them to the point where they're, they have enough income so that when those 16 weeks are up, that I will put them on a payment plan so they can pay off the amount of the of that time over time now a lot of people would not do this because of the risk of not ever getting paid wow and so i have people who maybe think i'm putting myself out there a little bit more than i should but i believe in people I believe in taking that risk. I want to choose people to invest my time and effort in because I believe that if we can create a world where everybody gets the support they need at the time they need it, I mean, what a beautiful world that is. I, I couldn't care with that. I mean... Seriously, because at the end of the day, like you said, so many people need you the most. You know, I was just thinking, we were talking about kids earlier on, and our kids need us, especially at the time when they they can't feed themselves, they can't clean after themselves and everything else, and, and we're there. And that's the part where we really are, you know, and we're not getting anything back from them except knowing that one day she might learn to smile or you know he might yeah. you know just hold my hand or whatever it is that's a little payback and what you are doing is nurturing people at a time where people won't forget that that's that's one thing because people are not going to forget the person who put them on or people are not going to forget because maybe they're not as confident in their own selves but you borrowing them your own confidence in them and showing them the path they would now take that you know because i i, I love that now what would be the best way that people can maybe see if this is something they can get started on uh, to work with you maya well um, my website is shecreatespeace.com and there's a page for the small business path on that. And, you know, the best way, the absolute best way is for them to set up a one-on-one -on -one call and express, you know, express interest in doing something like that. My first, my first phone call with everyone is free um, because I, want to make sure I want to make sure it's a good fit for them but I also want to make sure it's a good fit for me because if I'm going to do this I'm I want to know that they're committed to the whole the whole program I want to know that they want to be of service in this world in a powerful way 
And when I say that, it doesn't mean that they have to go out and reach hundreds or thousands of people. It just means that they want to put their their purpose and their passion to work. Mm, absolutely. And I'll make sure that all of these links are going to be on your um, show notes so that people can actually get started to work with, especially the free consultation, just so that people have an understanding of whether you're the right fit to work with them or not. Now, Maya, I can't thank you enough for the time we spent on a call today. And I really feel like, you know, in our little way, we've honored, you know, the journey your daughter took and, you know, what you went through as a result of you coming to peace with, you know, or coming to terms with her passing has now created a foundation for other small businesses that might not have the support or the means to get started. And now you've created something that they can, you know, use as a starting point for them to be, do and have a business that's either profitable and enjoyable. Now, I don't know how you would probably answer this, but if your daughter would have been there knowing that this is what the work, you're doing what would you say about mom today so she would be incredibly proud but i will i will tell you about a moment in the hospital before she died so she's laying in bed she's we've already stopped treatment we know she's dying and she was really more out than she was aware and she was laying in bed. I was sitting next to her. And with her eyes closed, not looking at me, she said, Mom, you are so beautiful. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you're not. And I looked over to her. And I knew in that moment she was looking at my soul. And... You know, if I could just say one thing to everyone else the, for the rest of my life, it would be that, that they, you are so beautiful. Don't let anyone tell you that you're not. Thank you. Wow. You're welcome. Wow. I appreciate you a whole lot. You have no idea. So and you've taken this now showcasing to people that can't do it for themselves and giving them that courage and you passing it on to everybody else so they too can get started in their yes. business. Yes. Well, there's the beauty she was talking about then. Thank you. Cool. Thank you now, so much. Now, obviously, I, I know I've asked you a lot of questions, but since I didn't ask, yeah. Yep. <laughs> what else is there? Oh, gosh, I don't think we have enough time for everything else. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just I, I am so passionate about this work and and helping people. And, you know, I, I've talked to uh, men in prison about creating peace. I've helped so many different people and it is such a joy for me every time I help. Absolutely. And what can people expect in the future? I mean, you've written four books and um, I think the journey doesn't end here. What can people expect? Oh, it does not. <laughs> no, it does not. Fantastic. Wow. I can't thank you enough for the time that we've spent today and for you really sharing your story and taking us through this whole journey because so many people when, you know, life throws a curveball at them, that's it. They're uh, taken out the park and you literally took that and showcased your beauty onto the world. Mm -hmm. And now you're helping others be doing, have a business that's, profitable and enjoyable and they don't have to expand an arm and a leg in order for them to be able to get started so i think i think 
you're doing God's work that in and of itself because when people realize their passions people really show up in the world and they've had somebody who viscerally supports them and believes in them they will do amazing work so yes I'm just hoping that this little platform that we've presented you on um, has done a bit of service to the journey that you're on so thank you so much thank you I I incredibly appreciate it Absolutely. And there you have it, folks. A glimpse into the extraordinary journey of Maya, a beacon of hope and resilience in a world often shrouded in darkness. So I want you to join us next time for more enlightening conversations and valuable insights right here on the online prosperity show. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and share this episode with friends and family who could use an extra inspiration in their lives because people might be going through stuff and they might not know who to turn to or what to do about that. There's people like Maya, who I viscerally believe are just there as angels in human form that will help us be doing, have businesses that are profitable and enjoyable. Help me thank Maya by supporting her cause and checking out her links that are going to be in the show notes there. Um, And hopefully, maybe one day, the person that you refer to this video might actually, um, you know, save the world in some way or whatever it is that they're passionate about. Until next time, stay prosperous. Bye for now.